Here at No Greater Joy, we get a lot of letters from people that are really struggling to be under the law. And it breaks our heart. Jesus died so that you're not under the law. You're under the grace of Jesus Christ. Then you have people scream, well, that's easy believism. Well, friends, there's a real easy way to understand what it means to be under grace and not under the law and not to chase the dead law and try to get under the, that broken system again. Check out this video my dad did a while back. We just recut it and put in a bunch of slides and different stuff. So check this out and see what you can learn. Christians are not under the Mosaic law in any sense, including the law thou shalt not murder. We're not under that law. Now, it's still wrong to murder, but we're not under the Mosaic law, which says thou shalt not murder. Because if we are under the Mosaic law that says thou shalt not murder, then we're also under the Mosaic law that says thou shalt not carry sticks on Sunday. You do, you will be stoned to death. So if you're going to be under the law, he said, you're going to be under the whole law. So many people are following the Jewish trappings today, picking up stuff that uh, God told the Jews to do, or trappings that they picked up along the way, and uh, are practicing <laughs> what they think is Judaism. All kinds of little stuff is available that people are using as means to worship, they say. We're going to open the book of Galatians and see what it has to say. He said, Paul said, you observe days and months and times and years. Now, when you observe days, that's like observing the Sabbath or a holy day or a holiday. Months, Jewish had certain months. Times is a, is a one-year period, a Jewish 360 day. And years, I'm afraid of you, lest I bestowed upon you labor in vain. Now, what does he mean? Paul had just been to Galatia the year before and given them the gospel and built up several churches, and he hears word that they are going back into Judaism or going into Judaism who'd never been a Jew. And he said, I'm afraid I'm, uh, I wasted my time with you. For he said, I testify again to every man that is circumcised, that is a Gentile decides to get circumcised to please God, that he's a debtor to do the whole law. In other words, if you are a debtor to do one law, then that means the law is still has jurisdiction over you, and therefore you're bound to keep all the law. Christ is become of no effect unto you, whosoever you are, justified by the law, you're fallen from grace. <laughs> That's heavy. He said, if you're a Christian and you decide that you're, the law of Moses still has jurisdiction over you, and you place yourself back under it, then Christ will not profit you anything. There won't be any salvation in Christ. He said, you're fallen from grace. Now, how do you fall from grace? Scripture says, as many as desire to make a fair show in the flesh, they constrain you to be circumcised only lest they should suffer persecution for the cross of Christ. Paul has dug into a motive here. This was Peter's problem when Paul rebuked him. Now, Peter didn't really believe that God was requiring them to keep the law. But he didn't want to be persecuted by the Jews that came up there that felt you needed to keep the law. He didn't want to have them saying bad things about him, going back and telling, hey, Peter's lost his faith. He got delivered when he was a child. He is no longer a Jew. He's eaten everything. He's dressed anyway. He wants. I mean, this guy, not even keeping the Sabbath, stopped tithing. He's lost it. He didn't want that kind of talk. As many as desire to make a fair show in the flesh, they constrain you to be circumcised only lest they should suffer persecution for the cross of Christ. Why the cross of Christ? What's the persecution there? The cross of Christ is a message that the sinner is now dead to the law, completely dead to the law. The law hadn't died, but the sinner did. And the law has no jurisdiction over a man if he's dead. And then that cross put him in a grave, resurrected him. He's a new man, a new creature, and he's not under any law, so much so the Bible said he's not a Jew now or he's a Gentile. He's not even a male or female. He's not a bond or a free. We're all one in Christ Jesus. New creatures, brand new. Paul said we preach Christ crucified under the Jews a stumbling block, under the Greeks foolishness. They were driven out of many a city by the Jews because of their message of the cross. Paul suffered persecution for the cross of Christ. He was even killed, stoned to death. At least he appeared to be dead. 
They left him for dead after banging his head all in. He pops up and goes right back in the same city and continues his work. Now, why would he do that? Because God already revealed to him when he was going to die and how he was going to die, and that wasn't it. He knew it. And I, brethren, if you preach circumcision, why do I yet suffer persecution? Then is the offense of the cross ceased. The people today who want to practice Judaism or practice the Old Testament law keeping and keep the Torah and honor it are afraid of the persecution of being a pure Christian of just standing alone with Christ and no symbols and no form, no horns, no clothes or vestments, no special days or special objects or special songs, just you and God, and that's it. People always want their religion to have some external demonstrations. Paul and Silas were put in jail and beaten for their simple message of the cross. Now, you know, this concept of Judaizers, didn't go away with the first century. There is an early church father named Ignatius who in 100 AD wrote, he said, it's absurd to profess Christ Jesus and to Judaize. Now that word Judaize is translated in the book of Galatians chapter 2 verse 14 as to do as the Jews do. But it is a single word, Judaize which means to do as the Jews do. For Christianity did not embrace Judaism, but Judaism, Christianity, that so every tongue which believeth might be gathered together to God. So it was still a hot topic issue even back then. So there are two covenants, bondage and freedom. Two covenants. Bible calls the law bondage. It calls Christ freedom. Two covenants. What does that mean? That means that the law did not evolve into the New Testament. The New Testament was not added to the Old Testament so that Christian worship becomes a combination of things old and things new. But rather, they're two separate and distinct covenants. One covenant supersedes the other covenant. They both cover the same general material and they're in conflict one with another they have different ways of salvation different ways of holiness different ways of living the new testament covenant is much higher calling than the old testament covenant galatians 3 he said that the blessings of abraham might come on the gentiles now i'm answering some of the questions at least a couple of you wrote in and this will answer your question, that the blessings of Abraham might come on the Gentiles through Jesus Christ, that we might receive the promise of the Spirit through faith. Brethren, I speak after the manner of men, though it be but a man's covenant, yet if it be confirmed, no man disannulleth or addeth thereunto. There was a covenant made before the law. It was a covenant God made with Abraham, a covenant that was defined as a promise. Now he said, because God confirmed that covenant, no man can disannul it, and no man can add to it. That's the nature of a covenant. Think about it. The nature of a covenant is it cannot be disannulled, and it cannot be added to. That is, it's a closed unit, sealed, and that's it, when God confirms a covenant. Now, I know what some of you are thinking, but you're telling us the law has passed away. I've never said that. That's what you think we're saying, but you're not listening. The law has not passed away. Not one jot or tittle has passed from the law. And it never will. God made that covenant, and it will last forever. Now, its jurisdiction covers certain individuals, but it doesn't cover a believer, a Christian. No man disannulled or add there to. Now to Abraham and his seed were the promises made. And he saith not to seeds as of many, he's talking about plural, but as of one seed, singular, and to thy seed, singular, which is Christ. So the promise of Abraham concerned Jesus Christ. And this I say that the covenant that was confirmed, remember he talked about a covenant being confirmed of God? Before of God in Christ, 
the law, which was 430 years after, cannot disannul. Now he said, the covenant God made with Abraham cannot be disannulled by a covenant that came 430 years later. The Abrahamic covenant stands that it should make the promise of none effect. It cannot make the promise of none effect. Now I've drawn it for you here. This is the blessings of Abraham. See, we're all children of Abraham by faith, but we're not all children of Jacob by faith. Was Abraham a Jew or a Gentile? He was a Gentile. <laughs> Abraham wasn't Jewish. He was a Gentile. He was called out of a Gentile nation. There wasn't any, weren't any Jews until you had Judah, the tribe of Judah. And that's what made Jews. Uh, Jewish is not a bloodline, uh, not until then anyhow, uh, because Ishmael shared the same bloodline, but he wasn't a Jew. And Lot and his family shared the same lineage, but they were not Israelites. So it wasn't until Jacob comes along that you have Israel, you have a Jewish nation. And so the blessings of Abraham have nothing to do with Judaism. So a promise is made, left-hand side, you see the prophet there. Promise is made to Abraham of justification by faith. The Bible said Abraham had righteousness imputed unto him. And the promise is fulfilled in Jesus Christ. Now, all that intervening time between Abraham and Christ, some 1,500 years, faith was not preached. Just the law was preached. So he said the law was added. We'll read that passage in a second. After 430 years, the law was added till the seed should come, which seed is Christ. All right, we'll come back to that chart in a minute. Let's go to some scripture. For if the inheritance be of the law, that is the promise of a coming Messiah, of salvation, of blessing, if the inheritance be of the law, it is no more promise. 430 years apart. Either the inheritance comes through the law or it comes through the promise. But God gave it unto Abraham by promise. Wherefore then serveth the law? He said, then what purpose is the law? Is the law any good? If we got the promise of Christ through Abraham, then what's, why the law? What need of, of it is there? It was added because of transgressions. Till, notice that word till, that's a time frame. That's a bracket. Till the seed should come to whom the promise was made. That seed was Christ, remember? So back to our chart. There's the promise made. The law was added till the seed should come. Wherefore, that's like a conclusion of what he said. Wherefore, the law was our schoolmaster, school teacher, head school teacher, to bring us unto Christ, that we might be justified by faith. But after that faith is come, that's the, the schoolmaster of the law, has schooled us up to the coming of Christ. And after faith has come, we are no longer under schoolmaster. In other words, we're no longer under the law. Now, when I graduated from my eighth grade class, my schoolmaster that had that spanked me, that didn't spank me, we used the word whipped. It whipped me twice with an oak paddle about that long. Now, I could hear it. What the sound actually was that 200-pound oak desk sliding across the floor every time he hit me. <laughs> sliding across that oak floor. Now, I was, that's the only time I ever really got paddled in school is that mean old eighth grade teacher. And I, it wasn't my fault. I didn't deserve it. I didn't start that fight. And when I got out of the eighth grade, I was so glad to be away from him. Just glad to be gone. I was no longer under him. He couldn't whip me ever again. He couldn't do it. Didn't have jurisdiction over me anymore. Now, did he pass away? Hopefully, but no, he didn't. He stayed. He, he was still there. Uh, Ten years later, you could still see him there. And I felt sorry for those poor people that were in bondage underneath him. Now, he didn't pass away. He still had his authority but I had passed away into high school. So I was under a different jurisdiction. Now, I remember I got rebuked for some of the same things in high school, but uh, that was a different law, different rule. 
They didn't paddle us so much in high school. They did in grade school. But after faith has come, we are no longer under a schoolmaster. Folks, according to that, faith is here now. I am not under the law. If you place yourself under the law, you're placing yourself under something God took you out from under, and you say, no, I'm going to go back. You know what you remind me of doing that? You remind me of the children of Israel. 1,000 years after the brazen serpent was lifted up on the pole, 1,000 years later, Hezekiah comes along. And sees they've erected that thing in a high place. And they're coming there to offer incense and worship. They kept that brazen serpent around for a thousand years. You know, it stopped being any good that day when God lifted up and they looked at, and they moved on. Hezekiah called it a piece of brass. Just a piece of brass. Now, that was such a sacred object after a thousand years. He just ground it into powder and got rid of the thing. Now... I don't doubt they were going there to get healed. They were going there and taking their sick children there. And every once in a while, for some reason, a child would get over his fever, and they'd go back and shout hallelujah, got healed by the brazen serpent. I mean, you know, it's kind of like Fatima or what is that thing that the Catholics go to? And so, you know, a weeping virgin, they just, it just, it has miracle power. They love the thing. And he grinds it up into powder. When you go back to the law, you leave Christ, and you go back to the law, it's like going back to a brazen serpent. Think about it, it's a serpent. It bites you. It's cruel. It's awful. We are no longer under a schoolmaster. So the righteousness of the law will never pass away. But the law's jurisdiction has retired for something more effective. 